Welcome to Tactical Talk. This is Zan Khan. Today, the topic of our show is Qatar and the Middle East tension. Uh, the guest of our show is Bilal Sambur, a senior geopolitical commentator and also a Middle Eastern expert from Turkey. Welcome to our show, Bilal Sambur. This is Zan Khan. It's a pleasure to have you on Tactical Talk. Thank you for having me on the Let's show. get to the first question. Donald Trump addressed the leaders of the Muslim world where they formed an alliance to fight terrorism. Qatar was also invited and was part of the coalition. Uh, what went wrong so suddenly that Saudi and UAE had to make such drastic isolation attempts on Qatar? Well, uh, that's a very uh, key question because everyone asking about why this crisis, uh, everyone is, is asking about the timing of this uh, crisis, why this crisis occurred in this time. And of course, the story of this crisis is very deep, but uh, we could start this crisis uh, with uh, Trump visit to Saudi Arabia. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, Trump gathered all Muslim, all Arab leaders uh, against and asked them to fight uh, against uh, extremism. And uh, Qatar Amir also was there, and he expressed his support for U.S. Uh, fighting against terrorism and extremism. Uh, so uh, Qatar is a solid ally of uh, U.S. in the Middle East. But uh, in this point, we have to understand that what terrorism means for Saudi Arabia and what terrorism means for U.S. For U.S. and Israel, terrorism means they understand uh, terrorism in a very broad sense. Whatever against U.S. interest and Israeli interest is uh, terrorism. For example, uh, Iran, uh, they accept uh, Iran as a terrorist state. Anyone who has a relation with Iran is, a, is supporting terrorism. Qatar is support, uh, has a good relation or moderate relation with Iran from U.S. perspective. Uh, this means that Qatar supporting terrorism or from perspective Israel, Qatar is supporting uh, uh, Iranian terrorism. On the other hand, from Saudi perspective, anything against autocracy means terrorism. Anything against authoritarian rules or autocratic rules means terrorism. And uh, countries like, like Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arabs, and they are really experiencing deep fears uh, since uh, uh, Arab Spring. Because they saw that uh, uh, the president of Tunisia, uh, the president of uh, Libya uh, had been toppled. They feared the same thing happens to them. And in Arab Spring, Qatar supported uh, this uh, uh, mass movement against uh, reg autocratic regime. So uh, they have problem with uh, Qatar for a long time. And uh, in twen after summit, uh, after uh, Trump's visit uh, from uh, to Riyadh, uh, second development happened in 24th of May. Uh, some uh, hacker uh, uh, intervened to Qatarian news agency and they wrote some statement uh, in the name of Qatari Emir. In this statement, uh, in, the, in this uh, statement, uh, Qatari Amir uh, is supposed to uh, write that uh, Iran is an Islamic country and uh, peop, uh, regional country, they must develop good relation with Iran. And of course, uh, United, Arab, uh, United Arab Emirates and Saudi media, uh, media outlets uh, presents uh, this statement 
uh, or as a, this statement as a proof which shows that Qatar support uh, terrorist state of Iran and uh, other terrorist organizations. So uh, this is the story behind uh, is, uh, Qatar uh, Gulf Reef. But the main thing is uh, Gulf Bloc, Saudi-led Gulf Bloc thinks that they have uh, full support from uh, new U.S. administration and they want to solve uh, Qatari problem for once and for all because Qatar, uh, Qatar the Saudi government and United Arab Emirates, uh, they consider Qatar as a small country but uh, uh, small country with big influence in the Middle East. They want to control Qatar. They want to uh, limit the influence of Qatar uh, in the Middle East and in, in Gulf region. That is why this crisis uh, occurred. Dr. Bilal, let's get to the second question. What is the Saudi narrative? Obviously, we need to know both sides of the narrative. Uh, what are they accusing Qatar of doing uh, that caused such a reaction? Well, uh, first of all, we have to understand uh, the nature uh, of the relationship between uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Uh, historically, uh, uh, the relationship between these two countries uh, is a painful one. It's a very problematic one. Uh, Saudi Arabia always look at the Qatar as a problem, as a source of the problem or as a cancer in the Gulf region. And, uh, and sometimes uh, the crisis occurred between uh, these two countries. For example, in 1994, there was a border skirmish between uh, two countries, uh, but somehow uh, they solved this problem. Uh, and 2000, uh, and also uh, Saudi Arabia is not happy about the policy of Qatar during Arab Spring. And in 1914, sorry, 2014, against there was there was a diplomatic crisis between uh, Qatar and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, and uh, Emirates and Saudi Arabia they withdraw their ambassador from Doha. So at the moment. Uh, these two countries have no uh, diplomatic representation in Doha. So, and also, uh, Saudi Arabia is not happy about uh, the relationship of Qatar and uh, Iran. Uh, Saudi Arabia said that, uh, said to Qatar, you must choose your side whether you are with us or with Iran. If you are with Iran, uh, you are uh, with terrorism. And also, and also Saudi Arabia said that you are supporting uh, organization like Ikhwan al-Muslimin. Uh, Ikhwan al-Muslimin is, is a powerful organization uh, which threats uh, Saudi regime, United Arab Emirates and the rest of uh, uh, the rest of Ara other Arab regimes. So uh, all these uh, problems uh, from Saudi perspectives, uh, Saudi perspective that uh, Qatar is itself is a threat for the stability uh, of the Gulf region, and Qatar is uh, the supporter of the terrorist organization in the region. Uh, we just discussed the Saudi narrative. What is the Qatari narrative? Uh, how do they respond uh, to these allegations? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Qatar government officials, uh, they are very shocked and uh, they 
uh, I mean, they don't know why this uh, coordinated coordinated uh, crisis uh, organized against them. Basically, uh, the Qatari government uh, responded this allegation in this way. The first one, they say that we are not uh, supporting Iran. Uh, we are living in the in Gulf region. In this geography, Iran is our neighbor. We are sharing uh, our natural resource fields with Iran. For example, North Field and Perch Parts Field. Uh, this is the area uh, Iran and uh, Qatar. Uh, together explored natural gas uh, natural gas uh, field, resources together <coughs> they say that i mean uh, this is a sort of geographical necessity uh, having relationship uh, with iran but that does not mean that uh, we are uh, supporting Iran or Iranian policy. That's something different. The second thing they say, they say we are not supporting Hamas. We are supporting Palestinian cause. In, in order to solve Palestinian uh, problems, we try to bring Hamas and Al-Fatih together. We ask them uh, we ask them to reach a peaceful solution rather than uh, using uh, uh, military uh, struggle. Uh, I mean, the point of Qatar, they basically said that we are not siding Hamas, we have relation with all uh, Palestinian factions, and we encourage them to reach a peaceful uh, solution which could, which could uh, contribute to the resolution of Palestinian uh, problems. The third thing uh, they say that they they say that they don't provide logistics or any armed support to Ikhwan. Uh, they say that uh, Ikhwan is the fact of. Uh, Egypt, uh, we ask uh, Ikhwan not to fight against uh, Egyptian government. We ask them to to have uh, to solve their problem with the government through dialogical means. And uh, on the other hand, uh, basically. Uh, they, uh, Qatar government say that we want to uh, remain in Gulf region as a sovereign country. We didn't support terrorism, we didn't do anything wrong. If they convince us Qatar government is doing something wrong, we are ready to fix this problem. But uh, basically, uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, and Egypt, basically, they say that they are uh, violated our rights of sovereignty. We ask uh, Gulf state to respect our right of sovereignty. That is the, that is the heart of uh, Qatari narrative on this issue. But we shouldn't forget that Qatar government now they don't know what to do. I mean, at the moment, they try to understand what is happening, why this crisis happened, and how could they solve uh, this uh, problem. Uh, from the statement of Qatari official, uh, we understand that Qatari side is ready to compromise in order to uh, overcome this crisis. Uh, uh, Dr. Bilal, do you see this being solved uh, through mediation uh, or do you see this issue being escalated? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we have to understand 
the position of uh, the position of uh, Qatar and the position of Saudi-led uh, Gulf coalition. Qatari government basically said that uh, if we did something wrong, uh, we are ready to fix it. So that means that they are ready for a compromise. But today, Saudi Arabia foreign ministry said that we don't need any mediator on this crisis. Uh, no one uh, should uh, take the role of mediation. But as I said before, that is not the first crisis happened between Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia. In, uh, in 2014 crisis, uh, the Emir of Kuwait played an important role uh, in order to solve uh, the, the, the past crisis. And at the moment, Kuwaiti Emir uh, has uh, strong uh, uh, relations uh, with uh, or uh, communication with the King of Arabia in order to solve uh, the current uh, crisis. And uh, Qatari government also support uh, the mediation of uh, Kuwaiti Emir, but uh, from my perspective, uh, Qatari government uh, uh, wants this problem to be solved as soon as possible. But Saudi government, I think that they are going to escalate this crisis until uh, they get uh, what they want to get. Uh, but who could be the ideal mediator uh, or who could solve this problem? In my view, uh, the Emir of Kuwait uh, has no enough power to solve this, prob this crisis. The only power who could solve this crisis is U.S. administration and President Trump. Because President Trump and U.S. administration uh, coordinated this crisis with the uh, Saudi-led uh, Gulf coalition, and, uh, and I believe that if uh, President Trump uh, really want to solve this problem, he could uh, solve and he could play the role of mediator between conflicting parties. So the source of problem is U.S. and the solution also is U.S. That is the... Uh, that is very important point in order to understand the nature of the present uh, crisis. Okay, Dr. Bilal, last question. What is the ideal solution to this problem? Uh, in international relations, there is no ideal solutions. I mean, uh, there is no solution which could please everyone in ideal manner. But uh, there could be... Uh, first of all, if you want to reach a solution in international uh, crisis, you have to change your attitudes towards your uh, uh, counterpart. You shouldn't follow this approach. For example, you shouldn't say that uh, so, uh, your loss must be my gain. If you follow this, this approach, you are going to escalate the crisis rather than resolving the crisis. And I think at this moment, uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Iran, uh, Egypt, and all other actors, they shouldn't, <coughs> they shouldn't uh, uh, insist about the loss of others and focus just on their gain. They must find a middle way solution. And this middle way solution must be based on some uh, principles. Uh, the first, this principle, the first principle is all country 
uh, in the Gulf region, they must respect uh, each other's sovereignty. They, they shouldn't intervene their uh, internal uh, problems. The second point is, uh, in Gulf region, no country must claim that uh, he, uh, it is the only uh, regional superpower. For example, uh, Saudi Arabia shouldn't say that uh, I am the boss of Arab world. This approach simply is not uh, working in this region. Everyone, every country must treat each other equally and respectfully. The third point is that uh, uh, Gulf country, Arab countries and Muslim country, they must be vigilant, they must be uh, alert about preventing a sectarian or uh, uh, ethnical war in uh, Middle East. Shia-Sunni uh, Shia conflict or uh, a conflict between Arab country uh, doesn't bring any benefit to anyone, any country. So uh, they must prevent a Muslim world, a war um, between Muslim in uh, in the Middle East and in Gulf region. Uh, the final point is. Uh, uh, I think uh, Gulf country, Arab country, Muslim country, they must change their mentality. Middle East and Gulf region is not a geography just for hegemonical struggle. Uh, they must change their mentality. They shouldn't focus uh, on hegemonical struggle. They must focus on living together in diversity, in peace, and uh, in welfare. If uh, they don't, uh, they don't respect each other's differences. They just uh, impose their hegemony on each other through using uh, the force. I think. Uh, every country is going to lo lose. So, uh, reaching a peaceful solution uh, will bring benefit to every uh, country, but uh, escalating violence, uh, I believe that uh, could create uh, very uh, unintended, uh, destructive uh, consequences. Uh, and I believe that all uh, uh, conflicting party must be careful about uh, this, uh, uh, the happening of these uh, uh, drastic consequences. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Belasambur, for being on Tactical Talk. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. This was Bilal Sambur, a senior geopolitical commentator and also Middle Eastern expert from Turkey. We were discussing the Qatar and the Middle Eastern tensions. Until the next episode of Tactical Talk, this is Zan Khan. Take care and goodbye.